All right, uh, let's just get started then. Hi, uh, my name is Priya Chaya. I'm the Associate Director of Content at the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And I want to welcome you all to the third in our pre-pass forward workshops on an introduction to preservation law and easements. Um, but before we get started, I have a few housekeeping items. Um, the first is that we are recording the session and any information we share in the chat and um, the slides and everything will be available after this is done. Uh, we will include it into in an, a follow-up email that will be sent out to the email that you registered for this session with about 24 hours after the workshop is over, so tomorrow. Um, you can also find the materials on the workshop page on savingplaces.org and on Preservation Leadership Forum, but we will include all the links for you at the um, in the follow-up email. Also, closed captioning is enabled and available through your control bar at the bottom of the screen. And also today, if you have a question at any point during the session, please use the Q&A function on the control bar and not the chat. We will be using the Q&A primarily to follow up on questions and things as they come in. So um, you can ask them at any time, but just make sure to use the Q&A bar. Um, also, please abide by the conference code of conduct. I'll, once I sign off and I hand this over to Tom in a second, I'll put all these links in the session, but um, including the code of conduct. And so with that, I think I'm gonna just hand this things over to Tom Mays, who is the chief legal officer of the National Trust for Historic Preservation, who's gonna kick things off for us today. Tom, do you wanna join us on camera? Thank you, Priya. Um, thank you very much for that introduction and also for everything you've been doing to help organize this webinar. We really greatly appreciate it. As Priya said, I'm Tom Mays. I'm Chief Legal Officer and General Counsel of the National Trust. And I'm delighted that you all are all joining us this afternoon for an introduction to preservation law and easements. As you know, this program is part of the Pass Forward Conference and is intended to provide a brief overview of key preservation laws that you may want to know more about and that may be referred to throughout Pass Forward or in other preservation work. Um, next slide, please. You see in the images some examples of the type of issues that we'll be covering today from Grand Central Terminal in the upper left in New York City, which is the subject of the Supreme Court's leading decision on takings, to Bears Ears National Monument just below that, which is the subject of challenges to the Antiquities Act, to St. Bar Bartholomew's Church in New York in the far right, uh, the subject of an important case on historic preservation and the free exercise of religion, to the Fisher Kahn House in the center, the modernist house in the center, which is a significant residential property protected by a historic preservation easement held by the National Trust, to images in the center from the Charleston, South Carolina Historic District, the first local historic district in the country. These images give you some of the range of laws and legal issues that are considered the heart of historic preservation law. And this introduction is to provide you with that overview. It is not intended to cover every aspect of historic preservation law, but is to be a, a primer and an overview of them generally. Next slide, please. Um, here's the agenda for the program today, and I'm pleased that this information is being presented by these members listed of the staff of the National Trust Law Division, many of whom are recognized as experts in these areas. They will each briefly introduce themselves as they begin each section, but I am particularly pleased that they are sharing the information uh, from their uh, relative areas of expertise with you today. Next slide. Finally, there, there will be many other sessions that pass forward that touch on legal issues, and I invite you to attend these sessions. One of the topics that we are not covering in this session is incentives, and I'll particularly point out the two sessions on the historic tax credit, one on November 4th at 315, and another on November 5th at 315, which will focus on case studies of historic buildings. Um, I will also um, really invite you to uh, 
participate in the easement roundtable, particularly for those of you with easement programs. This is a particularly popular aspect of the conference. I hope you will attend many of these and also other sessions at Pass Forward. I also hope that this overview of historic preservation law will be helpful to you, both for your attendance at Pass Forward and for your future work in historic preservation. And now I would like to turn this over to Betsy Merritt, my long-term colleague at the National Trust, to provide an overview of federal preservation laws. Thank you, Betsy. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to be summarizing the key federal historic preservation laws. So we have a lot to cover. Next slide, please. Two of the three key laws were enacted on exactly the same day, October 15th, 1966. So two weeks from this Friday on October 15th, we will be celebrating the 55th anniversary of the National Historic Preservation Act and Section 4F of the Department of Transportation Act. These were followed a few years later by the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, which was signed into law by President Nixon. These laws were in part a response to the community destruction that was being wrought by urban renewal programs and the construction of interstate highways through urban areas. And together, these laws have dramatically reshaped the way that infrastructure decisions are made and the things we take for granted as fundamentals today, such as the opportunity for public input to infrastructure decisions. They were established by these three laws. Next slide. For example, the National Register of Historic Places, the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, the State Historic Preservation Offices, the Certified Local Government Program, and the Historic Preservation Fund all were established by the NHPA starting in 1966. Then in 1980, Congress directed the Park Service to address tribal preservation funding needs. And um, in 1996, the first 12 tribal historic preservation officers were uh, designated by the National Park Service. And today we have more than 200 THPOs, tribal historic preservation officers. But let's focus on the two key procedural provisions of the National Historic Preservation Act, section 106 and section 110. Section 106 is a procedural stop, look and listen requirement and the regulations issued by the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, they introduced the concept of consultation, which has been a real game changer. Section 110 was added to the NHPA starting in 1980 and it describes special stewardship obligations for federal agencies who own and manage historic properties and special requirements for undertakings that adversely affect national historic landmarks. The National Park Service is delegated the responsibility to interpret and implement section 110 and they have issued guidance that helps us apply some of these provisions. Next slide. So here's the specific statutory language of section 106. Any federal agency having direct or indirect jurisdiction over a proposed federal or federally assisted undertaking shall prior to the approval of the expenditure of federal funds or prior to the issuance of any license, take into account the effect of the undertaking on any historic property. <clears throat> a couple of specific points I wanna uh, point out about this language. Section 106 applies to federal or federally assisted undertakings. And when the nature of the federal action is assistance, like a grant or a permit or approval, the undertaking is the action that is receiving the federal assistance, not the permit itself or the grant itself. Um, and I also wanna to point to the prior to language. This is critical. The agency must complete its section 106 review prior to making its decision or else it will foreclose the consideration of alternatives and foreclose the ability of the advisory council to comment on the undertaking. And finally, of course, the take into account language. This is the heart of section 106 and the advisory council's regulations define in excruciating detail what is required in order to meaningfully take into account the effects of the undertaking. Next slide. So this is the process for going through the section, section 106 review, determining whether there's an undertaking, uh, will it affect historic properties, 
Uh, over on the right-hand column, this is typically um, uh, implemented through identifying an area of potential effects within which historic properties are assessed and uh, identified. And then finally, how will those adverse effects be minim avoided, minimized, mitigated, i.e. resolved? And um, ideally, in, and in 99% of the cases, that results in a written agreement that is signed by the federal agency, the State Historic Preservation Office, and other um, consulting parties. And it spells out a process for resolving adverse effects, what mitigation commitments there will be, and um, how any disputes will be resolved. Next slide. Section 110F adopted in 1980 is also a really important provision, which applies directly to, which applies to national historic landmarks. And as you can see, the language says that if the federal undertaking will directly and adversely affect any national historic landmark, the head of the agency must to the maximum extent possible undertake such planning and actions as may be necessary to minimize harm. So when an NHL is involved, the agency is required to try extra hard to avoid and minimize harm. The key question here though is, what is the meaning of a direct adverse effect? Uh, well, the National Trust recently won an important court ruling confirming that a direct adverse effect is not limited to physical damage or destruction, but it refers to causation. So if the undertaking itself would cause the adverse impact as opposed to the actions of a third party, then that triggers the more stringent standard of Section 110F. And the case that we won involved the Carter's Grove National Historic Landmark, which you can see pictured on the right side of the slide here, which is directly adversely affected by the visual impacts of the James River transmission line permitted by the Army Corps of Engineers. The map shows the alignment of the transmission line. So the court ruled that the Army Corps has to go back and comply with Section 110F. We're waiting for that to happen. Uh, next slide. The National Environmental Policy Act, we turn to NEPA, which is certainly the most well known and the most widely used of these three federal laws. The regulations implementing NEPA are issued by the Council on Environmental Quality. The Trump administration adopted some revisions to the NEPA regulations that significantly weakened the law, such as eliminating the consideration of cumulative impacts. And the National Trust is involved in a legal challenge to those regulations led by the Southern Environmental Law Center, uh, which is currently pending in the Federal Court of Appeals. So right now there's enormous uncertainty surrounding the NEPA rules. And I'm sure it's very difficult for federal agencies who wanna to try to make decisions uh, while minimizing their vulnerability to legal challenge. Next slide. NEPA was originally passed in 1969 and 1970. It requires disclosure and consideration of impacts and of mitigation and alternatives. Um, but the agency is not required to change the project or adopt any mitigation measures. So it's strictly procedural. It applies to all environmental resources, including historic and cultural properties, and not just those that are eligible or listed on the National Register. And the public input process prescribed by NEPA is extremely important but it doesn't require consultation, which is the direct back and forth dialogue, if you will, required under the section 106 regulations. Um, so it's not uncommon to have a public hearing under NEPA where people testify and raise concerns and objections and the agency listens and says, thank you for your comments. And, and, and that's the end. There's not, a, there's not a back and forth. Next slide. So, what triggers NEPA? It's a different threshold than, the, than Section 106. Major federal actions significantly affecting the quality of the human environment. And those, uh, that category is what requires preparation of an environmental impact statement, a detailed statement about the environmental impacts. So that's a higher threshold than what triggers Section 106. Um, 
And the federal agency with the decision-making authority is the one responsible for carrying out the NEPA review, which is supposed to be done concurrently with the Section 106 review. Next slide. So the $64 million question is whether to prepare an environmental impact statement or an environmental assessment. And sometimes the purpose of an environmental assessment is to evaluate whether the impacts are significant enough to require an EIS. Um, uh, an environmental assessment uh, is what was prepared in the James River uh, transmission line case that I mentioned earlier. And we also won a court ruling that the Army Corps of Engineers was required to prepare a full environmental impact statement. Uh, so this is a question that is often brought to court because, um, next slide, uh, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the disadvantages of uh, NEPA is that uh, going to court is really the only way to resolve d disagreements or disputes under NEPA. Um, and in, sometimes uh, the court says, yes, the agency is required to go back and prepare an environmental impact statement. But in making the decision in the first instance, the agency looks at whether the project will have a significant impact. Um, and uh, there are also, each agency has adopted categorical exclusions for types of projects that are unlikely to have environmental impacts. And so um, an environmental assessment is not necessary. Uh, once the environmental impact statement is prepared, it's circulated for public comment, and then the agency issues a final written decision, which um, then becomes the basis for a challenge in court if necessary. Next slide. Now we turn to Section 4F, which is my favorite of the federal preservation laws because it includes a substantive standard. It prohibits the use of historic sites and publicly owned parks, recreation areas, and wildlife refuges for any transportation project unless there's no feasible and prudent alternative to using the land and the project includes all possible planning to minimize harm. Next slide. So in going through the process, the, eight, the transportation agency, this only applies to transportation projects, the transportation agency determines, um, will there be a use of section 4F resources? by the project. And um, sometimes the use is uh, in the form of constructive use, which means no direct physical damage, but the project will substantially impair the historic property or the park uh, to the degree that um, it constitutes a, a constructive use. And I'll go in, into the details of that standard in a bit. Um, there is an exemption if the use is considered de minimis. And in the case of historic properties, that means if you get a written uh, signature from the state historic preservation officer confirming that if you're gonna take a 10 foot strip of a hundred acre historic property, it's gonna have no adverse effect, even though you're physically using a portion of the historic property. That's the, that's the concept of the de minimis exemption. So assuming there's no exemption, then the agency has to evaluate prudent and feasible alternatives to whether the use of the 4F resources can be avoided and um, incorporate all possible planning to minimize harm into the project. Next slide. Um, so the feasibility of an alternative is rarely ever an issue. The Supreme Court, has defined it and the uh, transportation agencies have adopted in their regulations, the definition that if it can be built as a matter of sound engineering, it's feasible. But the arguments always revolve around whether an alternative is prudent. Um, and these are the regulations that have been adopted by the Transport Department of Transportation to try to define how you evaluate whether an avoidance alternative or a less harmful alternative is prudent. Um, you know, would the less harmful alternative involve some kind of unacceptable safety issue? Would it involve um, 
costs, uh, costs of, of extraordinary magnitude? Would it involve community disruption? Um, and so balancing these factors and looking at all these factors, the agency decides uh, whether a less harmful alternative or an avoidance alternative is prudent. Next slide. Ah, I didn't realize that was that was the last that I didn't have another slide. Sorry. Um, so uh, so a, as a result, um, these cases are often uh, enforce enforceable only in court, and um, they're they're difficult to um, to prove in court and often involve very technical issues. Uh, we recently had a court argument involving a historic bridge in Maine, for example, where the, the very technical issues being argued before the court had to do with whether the cost of the preservation alternative, the bridge preservation alternative, um, were costs of extraordinary magnitude and whether the Department of Transportation was evaluating and analyzing those costs in the proper, using the proper methodology. Anyway, um, I will uh, turn, turn uh, the, the podium, so to speak, over to Ross and Anne to address constitutional issues. And any questions um, can be put into the Q&A and we will hopefully have time to address them at the end of the program. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Ann Nelson, and I'm an attorney here at the Trust as well, and I'm going to be speaking with you about a few constitutional issues that regularly come up um, with the application to challenge the application of preservation laws, and particularly those related to um, preservation ordinances. The three that we're going to focus on are takings challenges um, and due process challenges under the Fifth Amendment and also religious properties, um, the establishment of religion um, under the First Amendment. Next slide, please. Um, starting with takings, um, the constitutional provisions that we, we look at um, relate to the Fifth Amendment, which says that nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. And this takings provision, this constitutional amendment applies to the states through the 14th Amendment. No state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without the due process of law. Um, as you can see in the Fifth Amendment, this does not prohibit takings, but it conditions takings on the payment of just compensation. Um, next slide, slide please. Um, when we talk about takings, we also um, often hear the term eminent domain. Um, what takings does, the Fifth Amendment takings clause does, is it protects an individual's right to not have their property taken by the government without that payment of just compensation. Um, in contrast, eminent domain is the government's right to take your property for that public use with the payment of just compensation. And there was what seems to be a recent court case, but doesn't seem so recent now, in 2005, um, Kilo versus the city of New London, which defined that public use term um, in the amendment and in this eminent domain provision to, to expand, I'd say, the, the, the use of what a public, a public use is. And it's, it's said that it could be used for the private development where there was an economically depressed area and a city wanted to take land to give to a private developer for the benefit of creating jobs and revenue and improving that area. Um, next slide, please. And when we talk about takings under the Fifth Amendment, um, there are two different types. We have physical takings, where the, the government actually takes your property, confiscates it, or occupies it. And then we have regulatory takings, which are really the key to the preservation law challenges that we see. And that's when re government regulations, such as local ordinances, leave no reasonably economical viable use of the property. And regulatory takings um, came up um, were established by the Supreme Court in a 1922 case called Pennsylvania Coal versus Mahone. Um, in Pennsylvania, the coal rights, the mineral rights are a separate ownership right than the surface rights. And the Pennsylvania State Commonwealth passed a law that prohibited mining of coal um, underneath houses. And so by passing that regulation and that law, there was no use of the coal um, in certain areas. Next slide, please. 
And so the standard that was set by that Mahone case was if a regulation goes too far, um, it can constitute a taking and compensation must be paid. So that was the first Supreme Court case we have that develops this concept of regulatory takings. Next slide, please. And, and the key takings cases I'm sure many people are aware of is Penn Central Transportation um, Company versus the city of New York. And this relates to not Penn Central, Penn, Penn Station, um, but Grand Central Terminal, which Tom mentioned earlier today. Um, this case is important for many reasons, not just preservation reason, reasons, um, but for those preservation reason, reasons, um, it established that historic preservation is a valid public person, purpose. So it, it upheld the local preservation ordinances that were being passed throughout the country um, around this time and really encouraged more municipalities uh, to develop their and pass their own local ordinances. It also established the principle that communities have the authority to adopt these laws and regulations to protect and enhance the quality of life for citizens. Um, and it established more broadly uh, the framework for evaluating takings cases um, with, with regulatory takings. So next slide, please. So Penn Central, um, as, as I mentioned, was in New York City and the Landmarks Preservation Law in New York City was adopted in 1965. Um, there was the, the, the train station was, was designated locally in 1967, and then the property owner sub subsequently requested a certificate of appropriateness to construct a 55-story tower above the terminal. Um, that, that request was denied by the Landmarks Commission, um, and they, they made some comments about how a four-story uh, or a, an, a, an addition that was four times as high as the existing structure would reduce a landmark to the status of a curiosity. Um, instead of putting together an alternative or requesting a smaller addition to the property, um, Penn, Penn, Penn Central uh, appealed this um, to the courts um, because they felt that they were deprived of a property interest in the air rights to build above the terminal. So they, they, they argued that this was a takings of their property without just compensation. Next slide, please. So coming out of the Supreme Court case in 1978 was a three-part test um, called the Penn Central three-part test. Um, and this is the test that's used to evaluate regulatory takings. Um, first, you look at the economic impact um, of the regulation on the property, not the property owner, but the property. Um, as, as it's said on the slide, the more impact, the more likely there will be a taking. This is an evaluation that's done on a case-by-case -case basis to determine whether there is any reasonable economic use left in the property with the regulation. Um, this does not mean, and, and the courts have held, that you do not get the highest and best use of your property. Um, and a denial of the ability to ex exploit a certain property interest will not be found to um, automatically be a taking. Um, this is what the vast majority of preservation cases are challenged under, um, but they're routinely not successful. Um, the second test, the second point of this three-part test is the investment back expectations. The degree of the interference that the regulation has on the reasonable investment backed expectations. So what is the owner's investment in the property and their expectations at the time that they invested in the property? Um, in the Penn Central case, um, the property owner purchased the property, I believe, after it was designated a local, actually they owned it beforehand, but they didn't challenge the, the designation, so they knew that was in place. It was already being operated as a train station with offices and other concessions. Um, so the, the court determined that the regulation on Penn Central um, the local historic preservation ordinance didn't interfere with the reasonable investment back, uh, investment expectations um, of the property owner in this case. And the final um, the final key point to this test is the character of the government action um, and whether it restricts development um, or the physical taking, um, such as excuse me, the character of the government action, such as whether it authorizes it as a direct physical occupation. And this, this is rarely um, a point that is used to challenge um, historic preservation ordinances. 
um, but it's the nature of the action of the regulation that is in dispute. Next slide, please. And to summarize some additional key principles that came out of the Penn Central case, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, historic preservation is a valid basis for exercising police power. Um, so again, this allowed other municipalities to substantiate and give them the authority they needed to continue to pass those local preservation ordinances. Um, a preservation ordinance may affect different people differently, but this does not mean that it is unconstitutional. Um, there were arguments made by Penn Central that they were illegally spot zoned because they were tr being treated differently than other people. Um, but the New York Landmarks Law was based on a comprehensive plan that protected, I believe, 31 historic districts and over 400 individual landmarks at the time that it was passed in 1965. Um, the mere diminution of property values, even if substantial, is not equivalent to a taking. As I mentioned previously, the denial of the highest and best use does not automatically mean there, there is a taking. Um, it has to be done on a case-by-case -case basis to see what the economic impact of the regulations is on the property. Um, the effect of preservation regulation must be measured in terms of the entire parcel and not just one parcel, one property interest. This is called the parcel as a whole rule. And in the case of Penn, Penn State or Grand Central Terminal, um, the property owner argued that the building and the air rights were two separate property interests, but the court came back and said, you look at the entire parcel. And the entire parcel, the tax parcel, includes both the building and the air rights as one. And this can be distinct, dis this can be compared to the Mahone case where the mineral rights were completely separate, transferred separately under different ownership than the surface rights in Pennsylvania, which is unique to Pennsylvania. Um, and incentives are important, but not dispositive, but a significant factor. And again, in Penn Central, um, the New York Landmarks Law had an, an incentive to allow historic property owners to use um, transfer uh, development rights, the air rights to other parcels, and that gave um, the property owner some economic benefit um, underneath the landmarks law. But again, not dispositive, but it can be a factor in these analyses. Uh, next slide, please. And since Penn Central, there has been a lot of taking as jurisprudence, and, and the National Trust does monitor these cases to make sure that um, the Penn Central three part test does um, continue to be upheld. Um, and we, will, we won't go through the cases, but I'm sure Priya has some links that she can send or I'll send um, later in the chat that outline some of these um, cases that relate not just to the denial of permits and designations, um, but also to conditions on extractions and, and conditions on developments. Um, and also um, the evolved Penn, Penn Central test, as they say, is We've got the three parts, the economic impact on the owner, the effect of the reasonable investment expectations, and the character of the government action, such as whether it authorizes a direct physical occupation. However, there was a case um, called Lucas versus South Carolina Coastal, Coastal Council, um, which related to a shoreline development where regulation made building pretty much impossible um, on a waterfront parcel. And the, the rule coming out of that Supreme Court case was that if there is a per se takings, where if it results in a permanent physical invasion or taking of all um, economical beneficial use of the property, then that can be considered a, a regulatory taking. Um, so we have that um, change as well. Next slide, please. All right, moving on to due process. Um, due process as well comes through the Fifth Amendment and the 14th Amendment as applied to the states. No person shall be deprived of the life, liberty, or property without the due process of law. And at the core of the due process clause is that everybody should be treated fair and equal under the law. And the process of making laws will be open to all, um, and enforcement and administration will be open and neutral. Um, this, this constitutional amendment was designed to protect individuals from arbitrary government action. Um, by ensuring that there's a process for making, applying, and enforcing laws in a fair manner. Um, next slide, please. Um, two areas where due process and preservation intersect. Um, procedural due process um, requires um, adequate notice of something affecting your rights. Um, so they 
they require property, uh, excuse me, mailing notices, newspaper publications, sign postings, so that property owners and, and property owners in the vicinity of an area that is being up considered for designation or a certificate of appropriateness have notice and understanding of what is happening um, under the law. Um, a chance to be heard. Um, there are public hearings, as my colleague Chris Cody is going to talk about, um, where there is a designation or a request to make a change to a historically designated property. Um, there needs to be a hearing. Everybody needs an opportunity to be heard, and it needs to be an impartial hearing. Um, I'm unbiased, and the commission members who are overseeing the hearings need to have no conflicts of interest with the property owners or others participating um, in the hearing. And finally, the third point of Duke procedural due process is uniform procedures that are fairly um, applied. And this relates to how the hearing is held, when notice is provided, um, that hearings are recorded, decisions are made and issued in a fair um, and reasonably rationally related um, way. Um, most frequently, as it's noted here, um, due process issues come up when buildings are designated or nominated to become local historic landmarks. Um, those can be done without not by others other than property owners. Um, so property owners need to be given notice of, of what the, what is going to happen to their their um, property um, and when they'll have an opportunity to be heard at those public hearings. Um, also under certificates of appropriateness and, and zoning reviews. And the challenges that frequently come up under due process are um, vagueness. The local ordinance is too vague, so I couldn't understand um, what was happening to my property. Um, so that's the constitutional challenge that we see most frequently um, with due process and local preservation ordinances. Next slide, please. Um, where to find due process requirements? Um, many states have passed laws that require meetings to be in the open so that the public can participate. Um, there are notice and hearing requirements at the state level as well. Um, as I mentioned, local ordinances have their own notice and hearing requirements that are outlined in those um, statutes. And um, there can also be commission bylaws, historic preservation commission bylaws that outline the process, the notice requirements, um, the open meeting requirements. So there are a lot of different things to look at and make sure you understand um, related to local historic preservation commission actions and the due process requirements. Um, and what about during the COVID pandemic, um, my colleague Jim Lindbergh in the Preservation Division and myself um, put out a, a form blog, uh, I guess about a year and a half ago now, which is sad, um, but that talked about some of the changes that municipalities and states made to these procedural due process requirements given that we were in a global pandemic. Um, sunshine laws were modified to allow um, <coughs> meetings to occur. Um, without the public during an emergency situation. Um, municipalities and cities passed ordinances that allowed for meetings to occur virtually and commissions and others uh, developed new ways to provide notice um, via email, by posting things on the websites and by developing different ways for um, participants to comment and be heard in those virtual meetings. Um, so I encourage you to look at those. I think most are hopefully on their way out since meetings seem to be happening in person again, but I think there are some positives to the pandemic in that more people were able to participate um, in the community processes and have an opportunity to be heard since meetings were held virtually. So with that, I am going to turn it over to my colleague, Ross Bradford, to talk about religious property issues. Thanks, Anne. I appreciate uh... You, um, your presentation. Um, so my name is Ross Bradford. I'm Deputy General Counsel at the National Trust, and I'm going to talk to you about religious properties and in, in the intersection with the First Amendment. I think a general caveat and a lot of the materials we've talked about today are very large topics of the law, and you could spend an entire uh, course just talking about the First Amendment. So in about 15 minutes or so, we're going to touch on the highlights of how the First Amendment interacts with zoning laws. And um, first we'll go through uh, the, the, the two primary clauses in the First Amendment that um, affect uh, property zoning laws, the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause. 
Uh, under the Establishment Clause, the government can't favor or promote religion over non-religion. And under the Free Exercise Clause, individuals can practice their religion without undue burden from the government. So these two clauses sort of interact with each other. Um, so you know, anytime government gives more difference to one or the other, there's a tension that's created. So for example, when government provides exceptions to neutral laws in favor of free exercise, the claims can be made that the government is favoring religion over non-religion and violating the Establishment Clause. But the opposite is also true. When government goes to great lengths to exclude interaction with religion for fear that an Establishment Clause violation might occur, a claim can be made that the government is creating an atmosphere that burdens the free exercise of religion. Next slide. Um, so we'll move to the Establishment Clause. And there are three main factors that courts look at when they're viewing Establishment Clause cases. Um, the first is, does the, act, the government action have a secular purpose? Is the primary effect of the action one that neither advances or inhibits religion? And does the action excessively entangle uh, the government in the affairs of their religion? So as, a, as an example, we've got Rainbow Bridge in Utah, uh, which is considered sacred by a number of Native American tribes. And in the 90s, the National Park Service developed a general management plan for the bridge that included a policy that requested that visitors voluntarily refrain from walking under the monument in an effort to respect the sacred status of the site. So an outside group claimed that that policy violated the Establishment Clause, and they argued that the government abandoned its neutrality by endorsing uh, Native American religion through the adoption of the policy. Fortunately, uh, a district court found that that, um, that was not the case, that visitors to the park uh, or visitors to the site were not coerced to practice Nat the uh, Native American religion and that they were merely creating a site that is the park service was merely creating a setting more conducive to Native American worship by requesting visitors to voluntarily refrain from walking under the monument. Next slide. So now we're going to move to free exercise, and that's, that's going to be the bulk of the conversation we'll have about the free exercise and the First Amendment. The free exercise clause is broken down into two concepts, and the first is the freedom to believe, and the second is the freedom to act. So under the freedom to believe, individuals have an absolute right to believe and adhere to any belief system they choose. Um, the complicating factor with that is that there's no real way to um, evaluate one's belief system. There's no definition for what a belief system is. So, for example, you know, a belief system doesn't have to be have a supreme being or be organized. So courts often have a, have difficulty evaluating this in the context of whether someone has a sincerely held belief. Um, so while the government can't uh, dictate what individuals believe, they can regulate actions uh, or conduct related to religious practices. Next slide, please. So the constitutional issues framed by the Established Clause and the Free Exercise Clause create a framework for individuals to sue the government when they feel their rights have been violated. Um, we're now going to look at the law known as the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act that codifies case law in an attempt to protect free exercise rights. RELUPA is a federal law that Congress passed in reaction to two Supreme Court cases, Employment Division v. Smith in 1990 and City of Bernie v. Flores in 1997. Prior to Smith from the 1960s to, the to 1990, strict scrutiny was applied generally to all laws that were challenged under a free exercise claim. Under, under strict scrutiny, in order to burden religion, the state had to have a compelling state interest that was nearly tailored to do so. Uh, in 1990, Smith carved out an exception to applying strict scrutiny in cases where, where the laws in question were neutral and generally applicable. This uh, Smith case created a great uproar uh, and Congress acted in the 1993 to create the Religious Freedom and Restoration Act, seeking to restore strict scrutiny as a statutory right under both um, state and federal laws. Under Bernie, the court struck down RIFRA because it exceeded Congress's power as applied to the state, although RIFRA continues to be applied to federal laws. In response to Bernie, Congress enacted a narrow law, uh, RELUPA, or the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act, so with RELUPA, it only applies to land use regulations or regulations related to institutionalized purposes. And generally, um, RELUPA uh, restores the standard established by Employment Division B. Smith so that if a, a substantial burden of religion exists uh, through a land use regulation, then the government must have a compelling interest to do so that is tailored using the least restrictive means. 
Um, also, RELUPA creates a right of action if land use laws treat religion on less than equal terms with non-religious entities, or if the application of land use laws has the effect of discriminating on the basis of religion or a religious denomination. Uh, finally, one of the most powerful things under RELUPA is the fact that attorney's fees are available to plaintiffs that win their cases. So there's a statutory right to attorney's fees, which can be extremely um, expensive for local municipalities. Next slide, please. So um, under RELUPA, we're fortunate that there's a um, robust legislative history that explains and provides a great deal of context for the basis for why RELUPA was implemented. And uh, it doesn't, however, provide a standard for assessing what a substantial burden on religion is. And so courts often look at a variety of different standards and there's no one single standard that courts um, agree, agree with. So some common questions that, that courts struggle with or apply when they're evaluating whether substantial burden exists is, you know, what is the degree of coercion or constraint on religious exercise imposed by the land use regulation? Does the regulation significantly inhibit or constrain conduct or expression? Does the regulation significantly modify behavior or violate beliefs that denies a reasonable opportunity to engage in those activities that are fundamental to one's religious beliefs? Does the regulation bear a direct, primary, or fundamental responsibility for rendering a religious exercise effectively and practical? So you can tell from the variety of different standards that are applied, some are very strict and some are, some are more loose. Um, so it's, it's difficult for courts to, to um, evaluate uh, what is a substantial burden. Um, and there are a variety of different standards that are used across the country. Next slide. Uh, under RELUPA, there are Two, uh, two burdens that must uh, that are, uh, are present. The first is the plaintiff's burden. Um, so anytime a plaintiff makes a claim under RELUPA, the plaintiff has the burden of showing that, that um, the burden on religious exercise is substantial. Um, but as I said earlier, because there's no agreement on what the standard for evaluating whether a substantial burden exists, oftentimes plaintiffs are fairly successful in showing that a substantial burden is present. So once that happens, uh, the, the burden is shifted to the government, and then they must show that there's a compelling state interest for the regulation uh, that's accomplished through the least restrictive means. So uh, take, for example, uh, let's say a, a, a church in Baltimore. This image is the Rochambeau apartments in Baltimore um, that were owned by a church, and they no, no longer wanted to maintain these buildings, um, and they claimed that they wanted to tear them down to build a contemplative, a contemplative garden. Um, and so the question is, you know, does the, um, the church have to maintain this building uh, in order, uh, in, in perpetuity, or can they tear it down in order to express their beliefs through uh, the installation of a contemplative prayer garden? Uh, next slide. So as you can see the image here, here's the result of that building being torn down. They did install a contemplative prayer garden. And um, you know, it's an open question whether or not there was a substantial burden there and requiring them to maintain that building um, or allow them to tear it down. Um, but some, some takeaways in this area of the law are that uh, for local governments are that um, uh, individuals who serve on preservation review boards should be mindful that their activities not restrict religious activities more than you would non-religious activities of the same type. Um, you don't necessarily have to cave to a church's claim that they are exempt or immune from ordinances. Um, RELUPA has a very iterative process where if there's a claim made that you can work to accommodate um, a, a, a church's um, objection, um, you should obviously be careful or cautious about interior designations of religious properties because obviously, um, the current owner um, may object to having their religious icon iconography um, restricted in a way that, um, that they might find is substantially burdening their religion. Um, you also wanna make sure that your ordinances have appropriate economic hardship provisions so that there are outs in order to get around restrictions on um, you know, maintaining or preserving historic buildings. But the, the final sort of takeaway is that you always wanna to try to accommodate um, uh, uh, these objections to the greatest extent possible uh, or, or balance those requests so that um, there's some sort of back and forth between a church and, and the local municipality. I would say as a general caveat, most of these court cases really focus more on zoning issues um, and 
you know, for example, two recent uh, two recent cases from uh, the past year or two. Um, one was related to um, Amish uh, out in Minnesota, and uh, the local law required that they install septic tanks. And the Amish objected to, to that and said, um, you know, this is a substantial burden on our religion. You know, we have a there's a least there's a more a least restrictive com uh, means. What about a, a mulch system for for disposing of, of, of waste? And ultimately, the court weighed those and weighed the balances of those things and said that there was actually a compelling interest to ensuring that water quality was preserved and and such. And so they found that even though there were regulations imposed on the Amish for installing septic tanks, that um, you know there was a compelling interest and it was really narrowly tailored. And so in that case, um, this is the 2000, 2020 case. Um, a, a state court in Minnesota to, uh, determined that this under RELUPA wasn't a viable claim. Um, so uh, next slide, please. So finally, uh, we're gonna wrap up with some Supreme Court trends. It's uh, no surprise to anybody that uh, if you've watched the news uh, that, uh, about Supreme Court cases and you're aware of the uh, fact that there have been a number of appointments to the Supreme Court, that there's more likely gonna be more deference given to free exercise over the coming years. Um, and I'm just gonna to touch on a few notable cases. Uh, the first is, or things to think about, the first is the Trinity Lutheran v. Comer case in 2017. And here the Supreme Court found that churches can't be excluded from state playground grants simply because they are a church. Um, so that's important because uh, grants generally, grant, grant uh, type uh, uh, systems that provide grants for preservation projects or other types of um, uh, bricks and mortar projects generally are thought to not violate the establishment clause. However, there are objections to those things. In some states, particularly um, in, the, in the Trinity Lutheran case, they thought that, you know, that there should be a strict separation from churches being allowed to apply for grant funding for, their, for basically a secular playground, even though it's on a church property. Um, a very specific case related to preservation grants that actually was opposite of this is in New Jersey, the Morris County case. Um, uh, the Supreme Court denied cert uh, for this case, even though the New Jersey Supreme Court said that under New Jersey's constitution, churches uh, can't be applicants for preservation grants in New Jersey. Um, and this was such a, a, a big deal that Justice Kavanaugh issued a statement um, and, and in this statement, we gain a lot of insight in his views on free exercise. And basically, um, you get a sense that he, he, he has a very strong feeling that, you know, barring religious organizations because they are religious from a general historic preservation grant program is pure discrimination against religion, basically on its face. And that, you know, in my view, prohibiting historic preservation grants to religious organizations simply because the organizations are religious would raise serious questions under this court's precedence and the Constitution's fundamental guarantee of equity, equality. Um, so you know where he stands on this issue. And then following that, there were two other cases, um, uh, Tandem v. Newsom uh, and the, the Fulton County case, um, the, the gay adoption case, where the court is actually signaling um, a, a bit more openness to revisiting Smith. The thought was in Fulton that they would overturn Smith. They didn't. They did sort of um, reaffirm that if there's any sort of exception um, to a neutral law, meaning there's any sort of discretion at the government level to grant accommodations, then that law by definition is not generally ap applicable um, and would be struck down. Tandavi Newsom goes a bit further. And um, even though this was not a case for the court, they granted injunctive relief for COVID restrictions uh, in California related to in-home secular and non-secular gatherings. Um, basically, the members of the court that wrote um, uh, um, opinions related to the injunctive relief order um, followed what's, what's known as a most favored nation status, which means that if a state grants an exemption for the exercise of any other right, such, as, such that the law at issue is deemed under-inclusive, the state would be constitutionally required to grant an exemption for comparable free exercise activities. Essentially, if there are other exemptions available there, you have to give an automatic free pass to free exercise activities. Um, next slide. And with that, uh, we'll pass it off to Chris Cody. Thank you so much. All right. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Chris Cody, and it's my pleasure to talk to you today about local historic preservation ordinances.
Uh, it's my goal in this short presentation to present you with a holistic review of local ordinances that typically impact historic preservation. And this, of course, includes local historic preservation ordinances and design guidelines, but it also includes other local ordinances and some state laws that can impact local historic preservation ordinances. Next slide, please. Let's start with state laws that impact local historic preservation ordinances. State planning acts are the enabling legislation for local zoning laws, which includes the authority to establish both historic preservation zoning districts and historic preservation commissions. State planning acts also contain the enabling legislation for other local bodies that impact preservation, like planning commissions and zoning appeal boards. As with all zoning laws, they're an exercise of the government's police power, which was found to be constitutional in the 1926 Supreme Court decision, Village of Euclid versus Amber Realty. So in addition to enabling those bodies, state planning acts also require municipalities to develop comprehensive or general plans, which are master planning documents for communities. State historic preservation acts usually concern the responsibilities of state agencies uh, state agencies and state undertakings in regards to historic resources, but they can also sometimes contain the enabling legislation for historic preservation commissions and historic preservation zoning overlays. So within one of these two types of laws, state planning acts and state historic preservation acts, you will find the legal framework which local historic preservation ordinances must exist within in your state. There are several other types of state laws that, depending on the jurisdiction, can have major impacts on local historic preservation ordinances. So open meeting laws, these detailed state requirements form the basis for the procedural rules for historic preservation commissions. All local ordinances must meet these requirements. Uh, real property laws. An example of a real property law that can impact local historic preservation ordinance is heirs property. If your community is in a state with heirs property laws, effectively dealing with the issue of demolition by neglect through local ordinances can be very challenging. Takings laws. Many states have enacted their own laws defining takings, especially in the wake of the Kelo decision, which Ann Nelson just discussed. An, an, an example of one that impacts local preservation ordinances is Arizona's Private Property Protection Act, which defines as a taking any government action that diminishes a property's value. And this has led to many Arizona communities, including major cities like Flagstaff, ceasing all demolition denials, while others have ceased all new historic preservation designations. Next is STR short-term rental laws. Some states have preempted localities uh, by prohibiting the regulation of short-term rentals within the whole state. Others have established statewide regulations. State law, as well as your community's relationship with short-term rentals, should inform what accessory uses your local preservation ordinance will allow or even encourage. And lastly, demolition by neglect. State enabling legislation can specifically define and enable communities to enact laws to prevent demolition by neglect. And some states have also even established review and appeals processes administered by SHPOs in relation to demolition by neglect. So these are all areas of state law that you should be aware of and review when considering your community's historic preservation ordinances. Next slide. Moving on from state laws to the local level, these are the bodies established in local ordinances that typically interact with historic preservation issues. All of them have legal authorities via local ordinances to positively or negatively impact preservation and effective local preservation advocacy requires engagement with all of them. Now, their names and exact authorities do differ from state to state and even community to community, but typically, generally, they are city council or the top legislative body in a community, planning commission, uh, zoning appeals board, and of course, most important for our purposes, historic preservation commissions. Now, city council is objectively the most important, in part because it appoints and can remove members of the other commissions and boards, but it also often serves as a venue for administrative appeals from other boards and commissions, and it controls the budget, and thus all funding for all historic preservation activities, including grant applications. Next slide, please. Planning commissions are also a very important body. Their authority is limited to making recommendations to city council, but they hear applications for rezoning, subdivisions, and PUDs, or planned urban developments. And these projects are often the largest scale new development projects in communities that can have massive impacts on historic resources and preservation. The Planning Commission evaluates these applications solely through the lens of their compliance with the established general or comprehensive plan, which as we discussed earlier is usually mandated by state planning acts. So this underscores the importance of including preservation at every level of that document, not just a paragraph or a chapter, but getting the language of preservation woven into your master planning document will pay dividends for years. 
And the Planning Commission also engages in planning activities and initiatives connected with the development or amendment of ordinances. So examples of this include amending or, or passing a historic preservation ordinance or a short-term rental ordinance and other ordinances that affect land use. Next slide, please. Boards of zoning appeals are another important body established in local ordinance that very often intersect with historic preservation. Boards of zoning appeals hear requests from variances from underlying zoning and also hear applications for specific uses within certain overlay districts. In both cases, boards of zoning appeals evaluate applications using very specific tests or standards codified in ordinance. And this slide has an example of the variance test from Charleston, South Carolina. Types of variance requests that can impact historic resources include requests for additional height, lot coverage, or density on a parcel. And many cities have set up overlay districts, districts with specific tests to manage uses. An example of this is Charleston's accommodations overlay, which covers downtown Charleston's main historic districts. In order to have an accommodations use like a hotel in this area, an applicant must pass a specific test reviewed by the Zoning Appeals Board. And these overlays and tests are important to ensuring resident quality of life by maintaining a sustainable balance of uses within historic districts. Again, these are local ordinances, local zoning overlays, and they can be developed specifically with preservation in mind. Lastly, it's important to note that most state planning acts guarantee a right to judicial appeal from decisions made by local uh, boards of zoning appeals. As I mentioned before, many cities also have an administrative appeals process that allows city councils an opportunity to review controversial decisions. Next slide, please. And now here we are to historic preservation commissions, the star of the local historic preservation show. Historic preservation commissions are established in the local zoning code. So their authority thus comes from the government's police power. An ordinance establishing a commission must have several elements at an absolute minimum. It should make clear that preservation is a community priority. It must clearly state the powers and authorities that the commission shall have. It must detail the procedures and rules for meetings, which as we previously covered, must be aligned with state open meetings laws and the constitutional due process requirements that Anne covered earlier. It also must, uh, an ordinance also must establish who sits on the commission. Now, in terms of what powers a historic preservation commission may have, their core function is actually to engage in historic preservation planning and designation activities. A local historic preservation commission's enabling ordinance must contain a statement of the resources protected by the ordinance. For example, all historic resources located within a historic preservation overlay zone and the criteria and process for nominating and designating properties for that protection. It is the job of the HP commission to administer this process and to lead community efforts to expand local historic districts and to list new ones. This function of planning and designation is virtually universal for historic preservation commissions across the country, yet it is often neglected, especially by commissions who have to deal with a high volume of design review applications. Though most historic preservation commissions participate in the National Park Service Certified Local Government or CLG program. This certification is required to receive federal grant money for historic preservation planning activities. And believe me, federal CLG grants are the best source of funding for historic preservation planning activities. To participate, in addition to having a commission, a community must also have a historic preservation ordinance. That's it. There's no design review or physical protections from demolition of any kind that are required for CLG certification. A local historic preservation can exist in your ordinance and be a CLG with no authority other than the responsibility to nominate and designate historic properties. And many actually start this way to get into the program, which then makes them eligible for CLG grants to develop guidelines and further expand their ordinances. And finally, here we are at the heart of what most people think about when they think of local HP ordinances, local design review. For your local historic preservation commission to have design review authority, it must be specifically enabled in local ordinance. Procedures for applications and reviews of proposed projects must also be established in the ordinance. And these procedures must meet both basic due process requirements and any specific requirements established in state law. There also must be enforcement procedures like stop work orders, fines and penalties established in ordinance. And depending on the extent of the authority granted to the commission, an administrative appeals process may also be something to include, as well as variances for things like economic hardship. Lastly, for a historic preservation commission to have design review authority, design guidelines must also be included in the ordinance, either in the text or as an appendix. While the Secretary of Interior standards are often incorporated by reference as well, individual guidelines must be included. 
Let's talk about this requirement in the context of the evolution of local historic preservation ordinances. Next, next slide, please. So this is just how I've come to organize local historic preservation ordinances in my mind. This is nothing official or formal, but to me, it reflects the variation and evolution of local ordinances. The generation one ordinances are relatively simple ordinances in terms of how they technically address preservation. They're usually adequate in terms of procedural matters, often having been updated to be consistent with changes in state open meetings laws, but they're sometimes substantively as short as one sentence and a vague charge to ensure compatibility. And these currently often fail judicial tests because they're an arbitrary, because they're deemed to be arbitrary and capricious in violation of due process requirements. Just giving other citizens broad subjective authority to veto proposed projects because they deem them incompatible to the economic detriment of applicants has unsurprisingly not been viewed favorably by modern courts. So generation two constitutes the majority of ordinances today. Instead of merely having vague language about ensuring compatibility, generation two ordinances have descriptions of specific design elements that are appropriate for local contexts, like materials, massing, siting, and architectural details. These can range from still being short, as in a few paragraphs with a few descriptors, to longer, sometimes impenetrably long ordinances with encyclopedic recitations of architectural terms. The generation two ordinances typically survive judicial review. Many have been updated with additional appendices as well as persistent design issues have arisen in communities. So there are innumerable examples of generation two ordinances around the country. And the National Trust and the National Association of Preservation Councils have both published extensive guideline on these types of ordinances and guidelines. So rather than tread again on that well-trodden ground, let's talk about Generation 3. So Generation 3 ordinances, they have even more detailed written guidelines, even more references to specific local contexts, all vague languages removed. And here at the end, this is the most important part to me, they usually contain tools and examples to help the public. Generation three uh, recognized that the goal is to encourage good applications to historic preservations with design review authority. And this is a goal beyond simply protecting, protecting against liability by having a well-developed, not arbitrary and capricious ordinance. The goal is to give the public as much information as guidance as possible, because that's how you get the best applications. And the less time a commission has to spend dealing with bad applications, the more time a commission can spend on proactive preservation initiatives like designation and planning. Think about it like this, an unsophisticated party in another state or country who may be considering buying property in your community's historic district should be able to look at your guidelines and even if they've never been to your town, understand what will and won't be approved by your board. Unfortunately, it's very difficult for laypersons to understand detailed ordinances chock full of architectural terms, much less visualize compatible new designs. So generation three makes it easier with visuals, more comprehensive guidelines, and tools. Let's take a look at some of those tools. Next slide, please. So this is the cover page for a recently enacted set of design guidelines from Williams, Arizona. It's a Route 66 town that's also the closest town to the Grand Canyon with a population of only about 3,000. Next slide, please. Even for a town of this scale, this is how developed their design guidelines are. This is an over 50 page document that's now been incorporated as an appendix to their zoning code. And in addition to having language for the ordinance and guidelines, like a generation two ordinance, it speaks to specific issues like under energy conservation, there's guidance for HVAC upgrades and window replacements. Sustainability is another area where, while not in Williams, guidance can be provided on climate change considerations. And lastly, and most importantly, generation three ordinances include visual guidance. Next slide, please. Instead of just writing that vertical windows with transoms are acceptable, figure number seven provides a picture of one from the local context to help the public understand what is successful and context appropriate. This extra visual orientation is extremely appropriate. Next slide, please. In fact, every single architectural term mentioned in Williams's ordinance and guidelines are supported by a picture from Williams's historic district showing that architectural element. This is the ideal level of guidance. It's impossible to read Williams's ordinance and guidelines and look at these pictures and not understand exactly what they're talking about. Next slide, please. This image is from Charleston's Board of Architectural Review Guidelines. This is an example of more conceptual guidance, in this case for massing and urban design responses. Again, this is the kind of visual guidance that's superior to written descriptions. Conceptual models are also more helpful for design concepts like massing and urban response, 
whereas photos are most helpful for elements like architectural details. Next slide, please. And this is my absolute favorite tool. This is an approval matrix to help guide both members of Charleston's Board of Architectural Review and applicants. Notice that it doesn't say anything definitive, just easier to approve and harder to approve. You know, this clearly lets applicants know that some design choices like lower ceiling heights and using composites instead of natural materials will be harder to approve. This is exceptional guidance for applicants, far beyond just listing desirable design elements and written guidelines, and even beyond photographs and conceptual models. These are the kind of tools that are included in Generation 3 ordinances that are typically not found in earlier historic preservation ordinances. Next slide, please. Lastly, I'd like to draw your attention to a few current issues that are important to consider when drafting or revising a local historic preservation ordinance. Um, demolition by neglect. This is a huge problem in, in preservation. Many communities address it by developing an entire separate ordinance that gives their historic preservation commission authority to declare that a property is suffering from demolition by neglect and to take remediative measures. However, developing a standalone demolition by neglect ordinance is a significant endeavor that has to include specific considerations like exceptions for economic hardship. An alternative path that I recommend is to give historic preservation commissions referral authority to building code departments. Most structures suffering from demolition by neglect also violate the building code, and the code officer is already empowered to undertake enforcement actions against them. The Historic Preservation Commission simply having a mechanism in ordinance to bring a neglected historic building to the code official and city council's attention can be a more achievable scheme than developing an entire separate demolition by neglect ordinance. So next is accessory dwelling units or ADUs. As we mentioned earlier, whether or not your state allows you to regulate short-term rentals and what your community's relationship is with them should inform your design guidelines concerning ADUs. You can encourage them or not encourage them via your local historic preservation ordinance and design guidelines. So this next one, feet versus stories, is, is really a public service announcement. I'm just trying to get the word out to everyone. When you're looking at your historic preservation zoning overlays and guidelines, if you can at the same time change the height zoning within your historic preservation overlay zone from feet to stories, do it. Feet makes you have a uniform skyline and discourages high ceiling heights. Stories liberates architects. Regulating height by feet instead of stories is an artifact from the 20th century and it was a mistake. Window replacements. This is one area where I advise all design guidelines have a separate section. Windows are the most commonly replaced building element, and old ones can be very difficult to repair or replace in kind. It's also a minor enough project that it usually won't go to hearings and can be approved at a staff level. So make sure that the guidance on them is clear in your ordinance and guidelines. So this next one, the availability of historic materials and skilled, skilled contractors is, you know, you really need to be aware of what reasonably can and can't be done in your community. An example of this is Adobe repair in Arizona. There are only a handful of people that are skilled at Adobe repair left in the whole state. So if there were an affirmative maintenance requirement to maintain Adobe at a certain level, it would be nearly impossible for many homeowners to meet that and it would be a futile requirement. And lastly, climate change. You know, many communities are already working on supplements to their guidelines to allow for elevating buildings and other climate considerations. When you're working on your ordinances, updating them or developing them, be forward thinking about this and anticipate it. Well, in conclusion, I hope that you now have at least some understanding of the world of local preservation ordinances and local bodies and processes that interact with historic preservation and how to design or upgrade historic preservation design guidelines in your communities. There are many resources out there that can help you develop or upgrade your community's historic preservation ordinances. And I encourage you to contact your SHPO office or State Historic Preservation Office who administer the certified local government in each state for your state specific guidance and model ordinances from your state. So thank you very much. Uh, with that, uh, I'll turn it over to the next presenter. Thank you, Chris. Um, now we're gonna to turn to preservation easements. Um, next slide, please. So basically we'll start out with a general definition of what a preservation easement is. And essentially it's uh, an agreement between a nonprofit or a government entity and a private citizen um, that uh, limits the use of property for the purpose of protecting a property's preservation, 
uh, slash historic or conservation values or resources. So what, what does that mean exactly? Well, preservation easements are restrictions on private property, real property, um, and they can be used to protect outdoor recreation, edu uh, national, natural habitat, fish, wildlife, plants, open space, including farmland and forest land. Um, but the topic of our discussion is gonna be focused on protecting historically important land areas and certified historic structures or historic buildings. Um, we use preservation easements to protect significant things about properties. So when we um, evaluate properties, we wanna look at, well, what are the conservation and preservation values that are important to protect? And sometimes that involves regulating subdivision, Sometimes that uh, requires uh, making agricultural uses um, uh, conform with sound agricultural practices or forest management practices that conform with sound forest, manage forest management practices, or just simply uh, preventing demolition of historic buildings or regulating changes or alterations to historic buildings and structures. Um, next slide, please. So you'll see in this easement, in this in this image, there are a variety of different types of properties that are protected by easements. As I mentioned earlier, uh, open space on the left and uh, upper left, um, historic buildings, interiors, um, very high architectural style buildings. So old modern buildings, agricultural buildings, commercial buildings, easements can be used to protect a variety of different structures. Um, and so it's a very versatile tool that we use in our preservation toolkit um, and one that both the preservation and conservation communities use um, oftentimes together to protect both open space and the built environment. Next slide, please. When we talk about easements, uh, oftentimes I'll refer to them as preservation easements, but sometimes you might hear people talk about conservation easements. When we talk about preservation easements, we talk about restrictions on property that affect four fundamental things. And one, the first is the covenant to maintain, meaning uh, under a preservation easement, you, uh, a property owner would be obligated to maintain the property that is, you know, do no normal cyclical maintenance and keep the property in a standard condition. Then there are prohibited activities under the easement. Those are things like uh, prohibitions on subdivision. Um, obviously, one of the biggest is prohibition on demolition of the building. And then finally, um, the easements are used to restrict property so that alterations or changes have to be reviewed by a third party. So if an easement holder uh, holds an easement on a property and the property owner wants to say add an addition, they would come to the easement holder to seek uh, approval for that. And then finally, um, property owners have what are called reserved rights. Those are things that they can do without getting approval from the easement holder. Things like um, mowing your, your lawn, doing normal lawn maintenance activities, doing normal um, uh, cyclical maintenance, you know, painting, scraping, um, replacing with in-kind materials, those types of things. Uh, next slide, please. So preservation easements have a variety of benefits and risks. So we'll look at this from the uh, perspective of both an owner a preservation and a preservation organization. Um, for owners of property, um, you know, you can donate an easement uh, on your property and you can continue to own and use that property forever. Um, and you can sell or pass it to your heirs or to someone else and, and be, uh, be comforted by the fact that your property is being protected without having to, to basically transfer it to another entity or organization. And the benefit to a preservation organization is that it, it, it's a very, typically a, a smaller financial incentive for them to put an easement on a property versus outright um, owning a property and operating or maintaining it. Um, one thing we didn't mention earlier is that you know, preservation easements typically come in two, two types, those that are perpetual, uh, those that last forever, and then and those that are uh, term limited easements. Oftentimes you'll find term limited easements related to grant programs at the state level where you're getting state bricks and mortar grants to improve your property. Um, Preservation easements are great tools. However, they are risks to, um, they do present, present risks to easement holding organizations. Uh, that means that you have to regularly monitor and review projects that come before you. And that oftentimes, or sometimes you might be forced with legal action or uh, the need to take a property owner to court to resolve a dispute related to a change or alteration that wasn't um, approved. Next slide, please. In the preservation toolkit, we talk about having preservation easements as an, as an alternative to local preservation ordinances or as a complement to local preservation ordinances. And I won't go through all the specifics of this chart, 
But um, some of the differences between preservation ordinances and uh, local ordinances is that you know, easements are perpetual. Um, local ordinances aren't, aren't necessarily perpetual um, or they aren't perpetual in the sense that uh, lawmakers can change uh, legislation overnight. As a quick example, um, in Washington, D.C., we were faced with uh, a potential change to preservation ordinances due to uh, a free exercise claim made a couple of years ago at, uh, related to a church in town. And, you know, in the matter of a couple of days, uh, city council was looking at, you know, legislation that would radically exclude uh, religious buildings from the preservation ordinance. So in that instance, you can see how, or changes from administration to administration or council to council, that if people's views change, they might change the laws. So easements are perpetual, local laws can be changed. Um, uh, under easements, there are a number of things that are sort of absolutely prohibited, whereas under local law, there are often safety features to give property owners certain outs, so economic hardship provisions, um, those types of things. But I think one of the main one of the main factors is that with preservation easements, there's a bit typically a lot more oversight because preservation organizations have or should have um, the staffing to administer their easements to visit them regularly. Versus uh, at the local level, there's typically not enough staff to go out and see all the local landmarks all the time to see if there's demolition, mine neglect, and so oftentimes it's a reactive sort of situation versus preservation easement monitoring is more proactive. We're going and having conversations with the property owners and interacting with them and seeing problems before they start. Next slide, please. So in the context of preservation easements, there are federal tax benefits under section 178 of the tax code. Um, and the, the three fundamental things that you'll want to be aware of are that if you have a property, you can um, put a perpetual restriction on it to restrict its use. You have to donate that to a qualified organization. Uh, and that means, you know, 501c3 or governmental organization, and it has to be what's known as for uh, exclusively for conservation purposes. Um, as I mentioned earlier, that can mean protection of open space, natural habitat, but the area we focus mostly on uh, in the preservation world are the protection of historically important land areas or certified historic structures, also known as just historic buildings that are listed on the National Register. Uh, next slide, please. So um, in terms of uh, big picture trends that uh, we should be aware of, uh, next slide, please. Uh, the IRS, uh, because there are tax incentives involved with donating easements, the IRS has regularly over the last several decades looked at easements very skeptically and have challenged a number of easement donations um, for a variety of reasons. Um, fundamentally, a lot of these um, disputes are about valuation of the easement, whether the easement's value is actually uh, valid and whether it, it can be substantiated uh, or not. But oftentimes the IRS will focus on um, sort of um, minor issues in these easement transactions that they say uh, basically don't meet the requirements of the code. So the, the couple areas I'll talk about very quickly are proceeds clause under these easements. So right now, there's been a lot of um, a focus on proceeds clause under under easement um, cases, where the IRS has argued that you know if the, if the easement holding organization in a condemnation setting um, is not um, entitled to the entire value of the easement uh, after condemnation, um, that that they are somehow violating the perpetual requirement of the of the tax code. And so there are a number of cases that have come out um, addressing this issue, the Carroll case, the Rose Hill case, and the Cole property holdings case. Um, and then specifically, and we'll put this in the chat a little later, uh, this past summer, the chief count, the IRS issued a chief counsel opinion addressing this specific issue. And basically the idea or the concept here is that you know, your, the value of your easement must track throughout the life of that easement and that you can't net out um, a, don a property's improvements from those proceeds. So in other words, if your easement is worth 10% of the property in year one, it's worth 10% of the property in year 50, regardless of any improvements the donor may have made over the course of those 50 years. Next slide, please. The other area that the IRS is focused on are easements that have what are known as automatic approval clauses. And the most recent case or most popular case is talked about is the Hoffman uh, case. Um, and it was reviewed by the Sixth Circuit. And in that case, basically, the court was looking at easements where 
the easement holder and the property owner, the donor had agreed that if um, the easement, the property owner presented the easement holder with requests for alterations or changes of the property, and there was never a response from the easement holder, that over time that that lack of a response would be deemed an approval or an automatic approval. And the IRS argued that if, uh, if that's the case, then the easement holding organization is not actually enforcing their easement, they're not actually abiding by the terms of it, and that it's actually not perpetual. Um, and the tax court uh, agreed with the IRS in that situation, and the Sixth Circuit also agreed. So um, generally, as a best practice, we don't like to see automatic approvals in easements. And if, if you're going to include an automatic approval clause in an easement, it's typically best to uh, draft it as a constructive denial, meaning you know, if the easement holding organization doesn't respond within a number of days, the request is deemed denied. Next slide, please. Um, the final section where the IRS has put a lot of focus on uh, their enforcement actions has to do with amendments uh, and amendment clauses and easements. And at one point, the IRS, and the IRS continues to do so, argues that you know, easements should be forever and that they should never be changed and that if an amendment clause exists in an easement, it conflicts with the perpetuity requirements under the tax code. Um, luckily, uh, the IRS lost that challenge in the 11th, 11th Circuit in the Pine Mountain Preserve case. Um, and basically, the, the idea of the court said, look, you know, easements are, 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 are not unique real property tools in the sense that they need to be flexible and donors and easement holder organizations need to have the ability to change or alter an easement. Um, and that having just the sheer factor, of, uh, the sheer fact of having an amendment clause in an easement doesn't in and of itself um, void the per perpetuity of that easement. And so um, in this case, a, a, a good drafting tip generally, um, both for preservation and conservation easements is that, you know, you want to have amendment clauses in your easements to accommodate future changes or alterations, but you want to make sure that um, if you are going to amend an easement, it is both uh, either a neutral, it has either a neutral or a beneficial effect. Um, you don't want to be in a situation where you're weakening an easement through an amendment. That would be something obviously the IRS would have a problem with, and that wouldn't be a, a best practice. Um, but you also want to be mindful that um, any sort of changes or alterations you make to an easement um, don't create, you know, private inurement or private benefits. Next slide. Uh, and finally, I'll wrap up with two, uh, two additional points. And the, the, the final one is, um, in the last, uh, I would say, three to four years, the IRS has focused a lot on the syndication of conservation and preservation easements. Um, and syndication is, is essentially the, the concept where an investor buys into a promoted and marketed tax shelter disguised as an easement donation. So, for example, an investor will buy into um, an LLC for one dollar and then the LLC will um, decide to donate an easement on the property and they'll get an overinflated uh, uh, easement uh, appraisal that says basically the property is worth five times as much. So their investment of one dollar has turned into five dollars in tax deductions. And the IRS uh, and, and uh, the Senate Finance Committee have focused on this um, pretty significantly over the past couple of years. Um, a, lot of this, uh, a lot of these transactions do happen in the conservation world, but they also happen in the preservation world. Um, and so there have been IRS notices about it. There's a very substantial Senate Finance Committee report on the syndication of conservation uh, easement transactions that you uh, should look at and we'll place in the chat. And then finally, um, the IRS uh, publishes an easement audit technic techniques guide um, and um, occasionally updates it. And they made some substantial updates to it in both 2020 and 2021. And we'll provide links to those. And essentially, this is the guide that all the examiners use to review these transactions. And it's important because it gives insight into how the IRS views easements, views the different requirements under existing case law. And it's just a great resource for easement holding organizations, donors, and the attorneys that advise them. And with that, I'll turn it over to Raina. Thank you, Ross. And I'm going to wrap us up by talking a little bit of an overview of preservation easement program administration from the perspective of if you work for or volunteer with a preservation organization that uh, accepts or holds um, preservation easements, a significant part of the success of using this legal tool is kind of the ability of that organization to effectively administer and enforce the easement. Um, 
in the recent past, we've done webinars on specifically related to easement monitoring and stewardship. And I know Priya will share those in the chat. So if you really wanna dig in more about those specific topics, you'll get, um, you can watch those webinars on demand at your pleasure. But I'm gonna talk through the basics about how organizations administer preservation easements with a few recommendations, particularly for those of you, if you're considering starting to hold easements with your organization, or if you're considering restarting holding easements as well. So next slide. So as Ross was talking about, you know, if your organization is going to agree to accept or hold easements, particularly if those easements are gonna be tax motivated and the donor will receive a charitable contribution, the IRS requires that organizations um, have to meet the requirements, uh, specific requirements to be what they see as a qualified easement holding organization. A qualified organization, they will agree to protect the conservation or preservation purposes of the easement donation and, and this is the key part, have the necessary resources to enforce those restrictions. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means. But generally speaking, organizations that are holding and monitoring and accepting easements are kind of focused on two things from an organizational perspective, transactions or acquisition of new easements and stewardship. So the management of those existing easements. And generally speaking, in the preservation community, qualified organizations are either a nonprofit organization or a governmental entity of some kind. Next slide. If your organization is considering starting an easement program or restarting to accept easements, maybe you haven't accepted new easements in a couple of decades, or you know, you're just you're taking a moment to reflect on your program and its effectiveness, I encourage you to think through a couple of these questions that I have on the screen. To start with, you know, how does an easement program fit within your organization's mission? Can you accept properties specifically that are important to your organization's strategic plan or fall within your ability to monitor and enforce those over time? You know, I think you wanna ask yourself, what are the goals of starting an easement program? What are we hoping to achieve by accepting and holding easements? And that's a great conversation to have with your board or with your staff or with other key stakeholders in your community. I think you'll want to identify short and long-term goals to establish and operate your easement program. Even if you have existing easements, this is always a great thing to do on a regular basis. This might include developing procedures or standards to administer your program, but also you'll want to think about what is the funding that you're going to use to have the capacity to be able to enforce and monitor those easements. Next slide, please. So Russ kind of chatted um, about this briefly, but you know, generally speaking, preservation organizations typically accept or um, acquire new preservation easements one of four ways. In some situations, a nonprofit or some, sometimes even government entities may acquire a property and then sell it subject to a preservation easement or covenant placed on the deed at the time, or um, placed in the deed or on the title at the time the property is sold. And, and this typically occurs through you know, real estate that's gifted to the organization or the aqu organization acquires the property through um, revolving loan funds. Many preservation easements originate through um, you know, a traditional donation where an individual donates the easement to an organization. Those can be tax motivated. And in many cases, they're not tax motivated. The, the property owner has an interest in seeing their property preserved and so they'll donate an easement without wanting the tax benefits. You know, as Ross mentioned, some easements originate as condition of grant programs, typically state or federal grants. Um, those are often term easements. And lastly, easements or covenants are used to protect historic properties being disposed of by government entities, such as through the Section 106 process. Next slide. So how does a preservation organization obtain kind of those necessary financial resources to monitor and enforce its easements over time? Typically, the preservation organizations require the easement donor or other funding sources to provide kind of what we call a stewardship cash contribution at the time the easement is donated. This, this cash contribution is added to a fund that's used for the ongoing easement and administration. Organizations typically use one of three ways to determine an appropriate stewardship contribution. And you see those kind of summarized on the screen. We did a great article in forum that Priya has put in the chat as well. And, and I'm just gonna briefly touch on these, but essentially you can calculate the annual projected costs for monitoring, enforcing those easement, that, that specific easement, depending on what the restrictions are, its location, how large it is, other factors, and then capitalize that for an endowment draw on an annual basis. 
You can also use a fixed percentage of the property's fair market value, or some preservation organizations use a flat rate or a range of rate dependent on certain factors. Regardless of which funding model you utilize to determine what is that stewardship cost, you want to be able to have some type of um, cash fund or financial resource at your organization that you can use to not only for annual monitoring costs, but in case of a legal challenge that requires you to enforce the easement. Next slide. Organizations should be strategic in how they acquire new easements. And, and, and really a, a key part of the administration and long-term relationship with the property um, and the preservation of the property through an easement starts when it's, it's being drafted and developed. If you're considering using an easement to protect a historic property, you should evaluate the property to ensure it meets whatever criteria you've developed or goals you have for your easement program. The National Trust, we have something called a project selection criteria that helps us narrow down um, you know, if, if the project meets kind of our, um, our goals for our easement program. And you'll typically need to complete a site visit to complete your evaluation. As part of your developing the easement, you want to be able to make sure that you're drafting this easement, identifying the specific historic, architectural, and conservation values of the property, and developing an easement that um, helps advance the preservation and conservation purposes of the property. A critical challenge for preservation organizations, I think, in, in developing new easements is addressing those other conservation values. Um, you know, if you have a large, say, a large farm or rural property that's not only has a historic farmstead, but also might have some agricultural land, you might want to include um, easement restrictions that address that open space and natural, um, natural resources or other conservation purposes. And on the other side, land trusts have the same issues when they're developing conservation easements that protect historic resources. I encourage you to reach out to land trusts or other similar conservation organizations in your, in your area and, and find ways to collaborate so you can better learn how to develop um, easements that protect the whole property. And lastly, I'll note when drafting new easements, um, consider the long-term stewardship, stewardship and enforcement of the restrictions. I think many of us who've worked in easements have, have, have easements that date from the 70s and 80s, and we've, we've learned that over time so that some easement restrictions have seemed great ideas in practice, but they do pose long-term um, stewardship or management challenges, not only for the easement holding organization, but the property owner and preser preserving the property. Now, with climate change being a factor, you really think long and hard about what restrictions make sense for that property um, before putting on them on the title in perpetuity. Next slide. Well, I'm not going to go point by point here. I just want to touch on the fact that, you know, if, if you're going to be um, accepting a new preservation easement at your organization, this kind of walks through a step by step of the best practices involved to kind of the due diligence and accepting and holding an easement. You know, your organization should understand, you know, this is a risk or a liability your organization is accepting in the into you know, the preservation of the property. And so you know, this process typically does take some time and staff time. And so um, there's lots of resources out there about um, some of these topics. And if you have questions about them, we're happy to go through them. Next slide. When I talk about stewardship, I'm talking about the ongoing administration of the easement, the day-to-day -day, um, you know, you know, management of the easement and kind of the organization's ongoing obligation to ensure the terms of the easement are being upheld. Your organization wants to develop a good relationship with the easement property owners, and that you can typically accomplish through having cyclical easement monitoring, promptly reviewing the request for approval, keeping in regular communication with your owners, among other activities. Stewardship also involves reaching out to new owners and helping them to understand the easement and its obligations. I know I wrote a piece for a forum blog about some common ways to track, track changes in easement property ownership. Changes in property ownership and, and subsequent owners from the donor is often where there will be challenges in easement um, enforcement or often violations if they're not familiar with the easement and understand its terms. Next slide. And easement enforcement, and so we've talked a little bit about this. So that typically involves when a preservation organization utilizes, there's remedies typically in the easement agreement that allows the organization to, um, to address if there's a violation. So if there's been an alteration without approval, if there's, um, um, you know, the owner is not upholding the affirmative maintenance clause, or if there's a not permitted use, 
Um, the easement or holding organization does have legal remedies to address that violation. At the National Trust, and I think it's a best practice of all preservation and conservation easement holding organization, you know, you want to seek um, kind of resolving that violation without seeking legal action to the best of your ability. But, you know, sometimes that's not feasible and you might have to, you know, to take a property owner to, you know, to seek legal action to kind of remedy that violation. But I would suggest that a major part of preventing violations include regular contact with your property owners and conducting inspections on a cyclical basis. This helps reinforce the easement terms and remind them of their obligations is a great way um, to kind of keep that top of mind for them so it avoids future violations. Next slide. So we commonly hear from staff or volunteers from preservation organization interested in kind of reviving their easement program. Perhaps you accepted some easements in the 80s and you haven't in a long time and you're thinking about, you know, we wanna kind of refresh our program. And so I thought I would just kind of, kind of give you my insights and what I would do if I was in your position. You know, perhaps you haven't accepted a new easement, you know, in a long time. And so you're just trying to get a handle on what's the state of your portfolio. And so, you know, it's always good to start with what you have already. Inventory your existing easements. Um, make sure you have copies of your existing recorded easement documents. You know, determine how you're going to keep records, such as developing a database, um, and how you're going to store your records, your inspection photographs, um, digitizing them if that's something that's feasible for your organization. Um, we just developed a GIS um, application and database for our program. And I know Priya will share that link in the chat and that's been a great asset for us and our easement administration. If you're kind of restarting your program, you wanna update or um, develop a few key organizational documents such as having an easement policy that'll outline kind of the, the framework of your program, including what types of properties that you'll acquire new easements on. You want to develop um, kind of standard operating procedures which kind of outlines you know, the day-to-day -day management of the program, you know, kind of the institutional memory so that when you have staff turnover, if a property owner, um, you know, has a new contact, that they have a seamless transition and how the easement in this is administered. And the best way to accomplish that is by writing everything down so that your procedures are standardized. Next, you'll want to establish a regular monitoring program that helps you consistently communicate with your existing property owners. And I think from there, that gives you an opportunity to really have a great framework in place to start accepting new easements. You can say to donors, we have this program, here's how it organized. Um, you know, we have a regular monitoring program in place, and then you can start um, share, you know, trying to uh, seek out or accept new easements. So that is all I have. And so I think I will turn it over for the Q&A. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, sorry, I was uh, busy putting links in the chat. So um, I hope many of you have noticed uh, that, uh, first of all, if all our panelists wanna hop on camera now, they can. And Rhonda, I don't know if you wanna stop sharing. Go ahead and do that so we can see everyone. Um, but it looks like our panelists have been busy answering all the questions in the, um, in the chat box. Um, I don't know if there's one that you guys particularly want to highlight that you've already answered. There's a lot in here that they've already answered that I think all of you who are participating can see. And they basically had to do with all sorts of the issues that were brought up during the um, presentation. So I can read the two that haven't been answered if that makes sense for you guys. Yeah, I'm seeing general nodding. Okay, so um, we'll start with this one from Evelyn that says, have there been any trends in whether the courts side with the property owner or with the easement holder when the National Trust or other easement holders have pursued legal action over lack of maintenance and or unapproved alterations? And I think this is a Raina and a Ross question. I'll let Ross answer that one if he's so inclined. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say there are trends. I mean, there are not a lot of, first of all, litigation is extremely expensive. So most uh, easement holding organizations avoid and uh, or come to some compromise with the property owner before litigation occurs. And so there aren't, there's not a great case uh, docket of cases out there that address these issues. The ones that we're familiar with, easement holding organizations are, they're usually they've built a solid case. And so, 
Um, there's a record that's, that's there and it's hard to refute a record when you've given a property owner multiple uh, opportunities to address situations and they fail to do so. And so in the cases that are out there, things like um, additions that were added without approval that courts have agreed, uh, have, have required to be removed, um, you know, that easement holding organizations prevail. Um, but I would say there's not, it's hard to say there are trends because I, I don't see a lot of um, these, these aren't cases that pop up a lot um, on the radar. And I think mainly that's because oftentimes they get settled way before they get to that point. The threat of litigation alone is probably enough to settle most of those cases. I would just briefly add, I mean, it's equivalent, but same principle. There's been a couple recent, um, I think, cases in the conservation easement world where the easement holding organization has also been extremely successful. I believe the Sonoma Land Trust was very successful in some litigation revolving tree removal. And there was a, a um, easement holder in Connecticut that was very successful. So I think in kind of the broader picture outside of preservation easements as well, it's been, there's been some su general success. Uh, great. Um, this is another question directly towards Ross. In, um, I think he means Relupa. What is the definition of institutionalized persons? Or she, I'm sorry, Leslie. I apologize for gendering you. Um, um, typ typically, we're talking about people that are um, uh, people that are in incarceration or other people that are subject to uh, federal, uh, federal or state uh, laws that um, either incarceration or your um, are uh, um, in confinement, so it's mental institutions, those types of places, those would be the types of um, individuals. Great, um, let's see. Uh, Irving is asking, um, does a term preservation easement in a grant situation cause a grantor to lose the tax benefits such as a deduction or tax credits that normally accrue to preservation easements? Yes, uh, if you're getting an easement that's um, the result of a grant, or if you're having to give it an, an easement because you're receiving a grant, it's not eligible for tax deduction because it fails to have donative intent. Essentially, you're, you're agreeing to get compensation or a grant in exchange for giving an easement on your property. So the IRS wouldn't recognize that as a valid uh, qualified conservation contribution. Um, I don't, there's one question that I, I haven't asked, but I'm not 100% sure what they were referring to. So I'll read it. And then if you can guess, <laughs> let me know. Um, have there, where did I go? Um, I lost it. Two seconds. Yeah, there's, a, there's another question in the chat on easements, which asks, are there any appraisers who can appraise preservation easements on historic structures in Colorado? Thank you, Tom. Ross, Raina. I don't know that we know of specific appraisers. Um, there's someone that I can refer you to that if there are specific persons, I'll, I'll put their name in the chat privately to you. If, if they know, if there is someone they'll know who you should talk to and I'll, I'll message that to you directly. And generally speaking, um, there are courses uh, for appraisers to take that focus specifically on appraising conservation and preservation easements. It is difficult to find those individuals. The Appraisal Institute has a website. You might look there, but Colorado, I suspect, is a, is a difficult area. Most of these individuals practice at a national level, so um, they will ne not, won't necessarily be in Colorado, but they may be somewhere nearby. Um, so I would I would check out the Appraisal Institute. You might get lucky and find the name of somebody in out west that does conservation or preservation easements. I would also jump in and encourage you to contact History Colorado. It's really a fabulous organization, and I'm sure that they've dealt with this issue in Colorado before. Yeah, um, I see another question just came in the chat. I would just ask that if you ask anything, please put it in the Q&A. Um, it's just easier for us to track and monitor. But Blair is asking if an easement agreement was never recorded with the county clerk's office, is it still enforceable? If an easement is recorded with a county clerk's office, is it enforceable? Um, if, it was, if it was never recovered. Oh, sorry, never if recorded? If it was never recorded, so. Oh. Uh, sorry, I didn't hear, I missed the never part. Yeah, that's a, a difficult situation, probably not, but it just depends on the facts and circumstances of that interaction. So for example, 
if the person, if the easement, um, if the property owner is the same person that donated it and it was never recorded, but they still own the property, it could very well still be enforceable. If they sold the property, it may not be. Great. Um, okay. There have to be other questions about like First Amendment, free exercise, takings, well, Section 4F. Like, <laughs> there, there's a lot of easement questions, but I will say the one question that people have asked me in the chat a bunch and I see just came in is, I'm going to take all the URLs and all the links that we're putting in the chat and put them in uh, a resource, to, like a link on Preservation Leadership Forum, but we will link to this off the Saving Places Conference website. And then everyone who has registered for this webinar will get a link to that in um, an email from, um, I think, Zoom webinar or directly from us um, about 24 hours after we end today. Um, so you will get all this material. Um, I guess um, the, let's see, uh, it's an easement question, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, my organization has an easement held by a state entity, but we haven't had much successful communication with them with regards to upcoming updates we are trying to make for security purposes. Do you have any advice for channels we can consider in order to make sure we're not making changes in defiance of our easement? I think um, a couple suggestions, not sure, you know, what state entity, but, um, you know, obviously trying to provide them, you know, written notice. Um, and so, you know, if I was trying to reach out to a property owner and they weren't communicating with me, one of the things I would do is try to send them certified mail in the U.S. Postal Service. And that way, you know, that that is actually getting to someone. And, um, you know, I know that, you know, we're a lot of, you know, government entities and workplaces, obviously you can see some of us, the National Trust are still at home and some of us are at the office. So I think, you know, it is a difficult time to reach out to people, but that would be one suggestion I would have. Um, Ross, if you have others. Uh, I think that you want to just create a good paper trail that says that you made multiple attempts to contact them, as Raina said. Um, and at this point, start um, going up the chain. If the, if the division that you are interacting with is not responding, then keep going up and eventually it will get to somebody that will respond. It may not be the response you're looking for, but it, they'll respond. I see Tom's answering one of these questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask the one afterwards. Uh, when an easement is required by a transfer of a historic property to a private ownership from city ownership of a designated property on the state and national register, the city placed the entire exterior of the house as being exempt from the ordinance. Much of the exterior was removed and changed. The HPC went against the easement as it was designated. The HPC never was included in the development and registering. Uh, what are the actions the HPC can do to not have that happen again? If you want to read that, it is in the Q and A. So that might also help if you to read it instead of me reading it out loud. I, I think I think the shorter answer is, don't let the city exclude it from the ordinance. Um, that seems to be the critical flaw. That you know, um, even though they held an easement on it, that you know, excluding it from the ordinance took it out of the HPC's sort of domain. Um, but uh, you know, given that it was owned by the city, that I mean, there's a there's a different a different conflict there. I mean, you've got city administrators administering easements versus the HPC, which might have a different perspective on how these things should be monitored and enforced. And and I would add too, and I think Ross is kind of going there. It I don't know how you know who is holding the easement. If it is the city government, you know, then then can the HPC be involved in you know, kind of administering the easement, that is possible. So, um, you know, I, without knowing more specifics, it's hard to say, but that may be an, also an option. Great, um, we have a, a 4F case. Betsy, I see you're typing, but maybe you wanna answer it out loud. Um, Betsy mentioned a few section 4F cases. Do you have a list of good case studies? Uh, I just lost it, sorry. Um, do you have a lot of uh, examples of good case studies beyond the Overton one? Yeah, sorry, you lost it because I pressed uh, send for my typed answer. Um, I'd be happy to provide a list. And, and I actually just wrote to the person saying, send me your email address and I'll email you a list. But I could provide it to you, Priya, and we could post it along with the other post-conference materials. 
Um, let's see, anything else? Uh, someone's asking about the transcript. We don't usually provide the transcript for uh, webinars um, just because um, we just don't usually provide that. Uh, when we do upload the video on YouTube, we do make sure that the auto captions are on there. So that's available. Um, but um, if you really need it, reach out to me at forum at savingplaces.org and I can see if I can pull it for you. It likely will not be cleaned up um, and we'll have lots of name misspellings and word misspellings. So it might not be of very much use to you, um, but I can try and pull it for you if you need it. Um, Maria, there's a question about um, free exercise and the establishment clause from Jonathan Stark Sachs. Maybe we'll have that as the last question. Yeah, let's do that. Um, do you want to go ahead and read that? Because I don't actually see it. <laughs> it, says, it says, how can a state or local government balance the requirement that their funding programs do not violate the free exercise clause and discriminate against religion and also not entangle themselves with religion under the establishment clause? I think that's a Ross Bradford. So, I mean, the, the main, the primary issue here is that if you have a funding program that you don't obviously want to, t um, fund, grant, grant programs in general are, are viewed as not being uh, in violation of the establishment clause. There, there is an exception I mentioned about Morris County where the New, Jer New Jersey Supreme Court found that that wasn't the case. And one of the caveats I didn't mention during my part of the presentation is, is in addition to, to the federal constitution, their state constitutions, and sometimes they have a stricter standard regarding free exercise and establishment. And in some states, it just may not be possible under the state constitution to provide funding to religious or organizations or entities. But if you do have a funding program, um, I would say that you need to apply it the same way you're applying it to everybody uh, and don't make a church go through unusual steps in order to comply with the, the grant funding program. And um, you know, make sure that what you're asking for in terms of any sort of justification around the grant or reporting or financial reporting is um, is reasonable. I mean, if it's not reasonable and you're getting into the weeds of a, a church's uh, finances or their 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 um, their actions or their 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 uh, day to day working uh, uh, things, that 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 sort of gets into that area of establishment. But generally, I would say you know, as long as you have a fair program that looks at everyone equally and you're, you're giving out grants equally and that you're not making the church um, provide additional information that you're not making others provide, you should be pretty, pretty, pretty secure in uh, not having it, you know, run afoul of the establishment clause. Great. I did have, I know we're at 358, but I figured um, it might be good to just respond to a comment Heather Hoffman made in that you guys answered in text, but um, someone has requested a verbal answer. Um, not a question, question, but a correction. In Massachusetts, zoning and historic preservation are entirely separate and trying to accomplish zoning through a historical preservation scheme will invalidate that scheme. Um, so I don't know if you wanna verbally comment on that and I, I and I think the point Anne was making is that things are different from state to state. So, oh, yeah. ab absolutely, it's very difficult to speak about local historic preservation schemes and ordinances, which are inherently local at the national level. So there will be variations in, in all of those issues. But I'm I'm very interested to learn more about uh, historic preservation protections that are existing in local ordinance outside of zoning law. That's a that's that's an interesting thing to explore. Great. And then I think, Chris, maybe I'm going to ask you the last question um, because it's not about easements, but I think something you can answer. Um, can you provide examples of places that have done a good job of fortifying their zoning ordinance language with preservation friendly strength? We need more character and historic. I would really encourage you to look at the example that I cited during my, my presentation, which is Charleston, South Carolina. Um, they've done an excellent job of establishing overlaid zoning districts specifically to preserve the quality of life for residents within historic districts, which is a preservation concern. Um, so many other cities have done that. That's the place that I am most familiar with. And it's a great place to start. Charleston is the site of the very first historic preservation zoning ordinance, and they definitely try and keep on top of things down there. Great. Um, so just a couple of quick announcements before we uh, sign out. Um,
early bird registration, uh, the deadline is coming up. Um, you need to sign up before October 5th, which means that October 4th is the last day for early bird registration. We also have a whole series of um, sessions related to law um, that are coming up at Pass Forward. And I see that Rhonda is trying to share her screen, but it's taken a minute. But um, I'll make sure to include that in the list of materials that um, I share out. Um, and let me just really quick dump this link in the chat so you can grab it for Pass Forward. Um, and as I've mentioned a bunch of different times, um, I will include everything as much as I can include in the with the recording um, that will go out in an email to the email address that you registered at the end of this, um, uh, 24 hours after the end of the session. So um, thank you for coming um, and have a great day.